On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is arisen. We gladly affirm this Easter day that Jesus is the Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. He came into our world, shared our common lot, conquering sin and death, and through his resurrection has reconciled the world unto himself. And his church and his servants, we gladly proclaim to all the world that Christ our Lord is risen today. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we come thankful for Jesus, for he is a gift more precious than life, because in him is the gift of eternal life. Because of Jesus, we can confess all our sins, all those ways we ignore you and seek our own will and thus wreck the beauty intended for us. We can confess because you have shown your love, you have ransomed us from the pit of our own making, you sent your son to reconcile us to yourself. Before his cross and around his table, we come to remember, to remember and to celebrate your victory at Easter. Now pour your spirit upon us, fill us with resolve and strength, kindle within us the fire of mission and the joy of witness. For this in all our prayers, we bring before you in the strong name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. Will you please be seated? There are just uh, three announcements that I want to share with you this morning. Uh, the first uh, concerns the services for Bill Butcher, who passed away uh, yesterday. His services will be here Friday uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, thanks from the community center uh, for all of the help. Uh, Daryl wrote, thanks everyone that helped, worked, donated, or came to the Easter egg hunt, bake sale, or roller skating. It was a huge success. Uh, and also, he noted, just in case you didn't have plans, the restaurant uptown is closed today. 
We will be celebrating communion, and since it is back to serving from the trays, uh, there will be those of you who uh, may be confused by the process. When you receive the bread tray, it presents to you an option. And the option is that you can either use the regular from the tray where the bread is, and you would take one of the bread cups, or if you want those individual self-contained units that we have been using, there are a number of those in each bread tray and take that instead. So you're making the choice of which way that you want to be served. And as is your custom, uh, we all t uh, receive and then we have the prayer and partake together. With that in mind, I welcome you to this service, Easter service. We are glad that you are here and sharing this day of joy with us. Will the deacons please come forward? This is a day that we celebrate all that God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. It is good that we do so, but as a part of this, as is always our case, it is also a turn for you to give back to the Lord. And the contributions that you make through this offering support the work of this church, which we understand to be the work of God in this place and this time. The deacons will now wait upon you for your offerings for today. Join me now in the blessing for our offering. Lord, we give back to you out of what you have given to us. Accept, bless, and use our offering to the work of your kingdom. Amen. You may be seated. And now it's time for a moment with children led by Susie. Easter? Yes. What do you like about Easter? I like chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Anybody like candy. else? You like what? Candy. Candy. Stuffy. Stuffies. Anything else? No? Okay, that's all right. Um, we're going to talk about Easter a long time ago. Actually, we're going to talk about a little bit of everything here, real quick. Um, because it's amazing how God, our God works. Um, uh, Savannah, I'm going to pick on you this morning, okay? Okay. All right. Let's say you're at school. Somebody does something super bad, like really bad. They're not going to get in trouble. You are. How's that sound? 
terrible. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. That's not fair, right, is it? No, it's not. That's like our Jesus. Let me tell you, God, God had a plan for us, and he knew that we needed Jesus. Did you know that? Isn't that amazing? He loved us so much. He knew, and he sent that baby that first Christmas, baby Jesus, didn't he? For and us. He Look at it. That's his birthday. That's right. That is his birthday. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for us. Isn't that amazing? Yep. So there's baby Jesus, part of God's plan. Well, Jesus grew, and he was walking the earth, teaching people about God, how to love God, and how much God loves us. And um, a lot of people just what? loved what he was telling us about how we should love God and God loves us. But there were some people, you won't believe this, some people didn't like what, they, that Jesus, what Jesus had to say. Can you believe that? No, they didn't like it one bit. Matter of fact, they sent, they sent these soldiers to arrest Jesus. What? Yeah, they did. Oh, no. And you know what they did? They hung him on a cross. If I can get him on here. Oh no! Yeah, they hung him on the cross to die. He had he had his um, hands nailed and his feet. He did. Yes, he did, Savannah. Not oh. good. Everyone that loved Jesus at that time was so sad. It was very sad. They didn't know the end of the story. And it was sad anyway Jesus what they did to him. Jesus didn't deserve that. He did not deserve it. Just like, did you deserve to get punished for what somebody else did? Mm -hmm. No, but that's why Jesus came. He came to take away all of the things that we did are wrong. Those wrong things are called sins. Can you guys say sins? Sins. It's our bad choices, the things that we do that separate us from God. But, but we have Jesus. And that is a great thing. And let me show you what happened. They took his body down after he had died. And they placed it in a tomb. So we're going we're to just put him right into the tomb, okay? Right into this tomb. And then they, oh, they were scared that somebody would take his body. They put a big stone across the tomb. Because they didn't want his body to get out. And they even put guards there. But some of Jesus' friends, Mary, if I can find her in here, and a couple of her friends got up early three days later. And they went to that tomb. And they were saying to each other, how are we going to get that big stone out of the way? Because it was huge and heavy. They weren't going to be able to get it out of the way. They found the stone was rolled away. And when they went in the tomb, there was a bright light and a messenger from God saying, your, your Savior is not here. He has risen. He's alive. Is that wonderful news? Yeah, Jesus was alive. Yeah, look, do this with me. Jesus, Jesus died, died for, for my, my sins, sins and rose, rose again. again. Do you see all the crosses in here? They're all yeah. on the lights, they're on the pews. There's one back here, there's one here. That cross is so important. Remember I told you, so we have God. Put your hand out, oh, put your left hand out over here. We have God over here. And we have us over here. We needed something to connect us. Guess, guess who does? Who, who brings us to God? Nobody but Jesus. Jesus said, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So make your cross. That cross is so important. Because that takes us to God, doesn't it? Takes us to, it takes us to God. All that love that God gave us. So when the, the women went to the tomb... Um, when they went to the tomb, was Jesus, first he was in there, right? They wrapped him up and they put him in the tomb. Look at Mr. Nichols. So Jesus is in that tomb. But when the ladies went on that Sunday morning, when they went, the tomb was empty. Isn't that amazing? Chicken. And isn't that wonderful? Chicken. Jesus lives, doesn't he? It's a wonderful story. How did he do that? Show us that again, Mr. Nichols. Jesus is in the tomb. 
And then the tomb was? Okay. What? How did he do that? How did he? He's tricky, isn't he? Chicken. <laughs> you going to show him your trick? What? <laughs> So here, give me your Easter egg. So, so if you find an empty Easter egg, you can think, oh, it's empty like the tomb. Because where's Jesus? He's not dead anymore, is he? He lives for us. Let me see. He lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us so incredibly much that you gave us Jesus. And oh, Jesus, thank you for loving us so much as well. We want to be more like you. We want to carry your love and kindness out to everyone we meet and know. And tell them about you, that you are alive and you love us, every one of us. Thank you. Amen. Now, there's a bag right there on that pew. If you grab one, you can take it back with you, okay? Yeah. All right. Happy Easter. Grab one of those bags and take it with you. Power on as we come to this time of prayer there is so very much to pray for there are the concerns we have for members and friends. There are illnesses, there are prognoses waiting. Uh, there are events looming in the lives of people. There are choices to be made. There are deaths to remember and to, to honor. We also are aware of all of the misery in this world, especially that visited upon uh, the Ukraine. And we lift all of those prayers, but most especially on this day, we pray for what God has done for us. Will you join me in prayer? Creator God, springtime is a time of hope and renewal. In this season, there are so many visual reminders of the hope that is within us, sweeping away as it does our gloom, lighting the fear-filled shadows, renewing within us the passion for wonder. We come before you this day, O Lord, our God, ready to be surprised by the wonder and majesty of life and to celebrate the new life that you create out of all of our dyings. For we celebrate this day what you have done in Christ Jesus our Lord. But it is not an event we celebrate as much as it is the realization that the life which moves through us all like our very pulse beat is your saving love. And yet even as we come to celebrate the resurrection from death to life, the triumph of your power over all the power and limitations of humanity. We confess to being uneasy about our future. For despite the assurance of our faith proclaimed this day, we still need to know that you are with us and that we are with you. So let us feel you on our pulses and fill us with the faith that as we live and die, it is forever and always in the hollow of your hand. Release within us all those mute longings hidden in our hearts that open us to the glory that is you. Let your spirit blow through us, freshening our outlook and stirring us to new beginnings. Shake us and shape us into a springtime people with the glory of Easter in our eyes. For this we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bed and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We have uh, two scripture lessons that probably today no one would ever have picked for Easter. The first is taken from 1 Peter 3 verses 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, 
not for the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is, it, and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And the second is taken from the 24th Psalm, verses 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of my Almighty, he is the King of glory. When you visit different churches, you have to be very careful. Do you know what I'm talking about? For example, if you were to show up in a church you've not been to on a Sunday communion was being served, you'd better watch and figure out how they do it, or you're going to end up doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. You know, some people partake as served and return the cup to the tray. Some partake and place the cup in the pew rack. Some serve, hold the cup, and partake together, and then look around for what they're supposed to do with the cup. You better be careful. The same is true of the Lord's Prayer. How many times have you worshipped somewhere else and they got to the Lord's Prayer, which you learned a long time ago, and you say trespasses, and they say sins or debts? you got to be careful or else you're going to be so self-conscious that you may end up with no sense of worship at all. I learned the importance of this when I was a visiting uh, preacher, uh, making uh, as part of my role as being a trainer for the Logos ministry. I might be preaching in a Presbyterian church, a Methodist church, and even once a Lutheran church. So I always made sure that I knew every single thing on the order of worship. And at one church I was explaining to the host pastor why I was doing that, and she laughed and said that she had learned from preaching elsewhere that there's one other thing you should always ask. What is that, I said. She said, you have to ask, do you descend into hell? You see, in the Methodist Church, they recite the Apostles' Creed every Sunday, and since we don't, here it is. Would you put that up, please? One more. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Next one, please. What I wanted you to notice was that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried, and descended to hell. Thank you, Billy. The reason why this visiting pastor had asked, do you descend into hell, is because many of the congregations that use the Apostles' Creed don't like that line. Now think about that. Does that fit your understanding of Christ to say he descended into hell? Well, these congregations over time had decided that they did not accept that, and so they just stopped saying it. And so, if you were the visiting pastor and you did not ask, you might be descending into hell while the congregation was ascending into heaven. The Apostles' Creed was written not by the apostles, but rather as a summary of the essential elements of faith formulated by the church in order to define the correct content of the Christian faith. It was made necessary because people at the time were saying things that were contrary to what was regarded as an accurate understanding. In fact, if you read the Apostles' Creed, you will get a feel for what kind of problems the church felt had to be addressed at the time of its writing. 
If you notice in the first part, just the verbs that are mentioned. Conceived, born, suffered, crucified, died, buried. All stress the humanity of Jesus. This because it was necessary because there was an element in the church at the time that said Jesus was not really human. He was God pretending to be human. Now the church would have none of that because if Jesus was not really human, then the cross is a fraud. Well, it might be based on our text from 1 Peter 3, and most particularly that verse 19 where it says, He went and preached to the spirits in prison who had disobeyed God long ago. Scholars have long felt that it was a reference to the dead. And Eugene Patterson, in his translation, said it this way, Jesus went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in the prison of judgment because they would not listen to God. This is one of the parts of the Bible where it's hard for us to read with understanding because the understanding of the people who wrote it and first heard it is different from ours. For today's purposes, one of the biblical words that the people at that time of the Bible would not have defined the way we define it now is the word hell. We think of hell as a place of eternal punishment presided over by Satan who is like an eternal tormentor whose sole purpose is to make the lives of those who dwell in hell, well, a living hell. You can supply the details. Fire and brimstone, imps with horns and pointed tails. In fact, I suspect that most of us can paint a more vivid picture of hell than we can of heaven. There's only one problem with our picture of hell. It's not biblical. The biblical word would have been Sheol, and Sheol was not the hell we imagine. Rather, Sheol was the place of the dead. You see, in the Old Testament times, there was no firm concept of what heaven was or even of life after death. And so what happened to people when they died? Well, they went to Sheol. It was the dwelling place of the dead. When we think of hell, we're borrowing images from John Milton's Paradise Lost and from Dante's Inferno or even Michelangelo's painting, far more than we are from the Bible. When Peter wrote to the Christians of his day, they knew about Sheol, the place of the dead. So when he says Jesus went and preached to them, he is promising to them a wonderful thing. He is promising them that those who have died are not beyond the reach of God's salvation. They may be dead to us, but they are not to God. How Sheol became hell is that when the Hebrew word was translated into Greek, the language in which the New Testament was written, they used the Greek word Hades, which we have translated into hell. Now here's the good part. It is very likely that the Christians to whom Peter wrote might have been familiar with one of those Christian writings that were not included in the Bible as we have it. Most particularly, I'm speaking of the Gospel of Nicodemus. That book tells us a story that might help us this day. Now, I want to, I want to describe this as a movie or a drama. And to do that, you've got to have a cast in mind. So I want to cast in your mind Robert De Niro as Satan. I do so because of the way that De Niro can play a totally innocent character, and yet you're never sure about him because of the way that sneer always plays around his mouth. And conversely, I chose De Niro because he can play a truly evil person, but always with a veneer of civility. Now we need a star to play the role of death. And I thought long about this, and the only one I could come up with is Dom DeLuise. Short and fat because of all the souls he had devoured over the ages, but forever nervous and seemingly always on the verge of panic. So, with that cast in mind, the screen comes to life in one of those slow pans that movies just seem to like to use to show you the whole of the scene. It shows hell and all of its occupants. It is a place that seems unending with a population that is unlimited. It's dark. It's gloomy. It is a forbidding place. 
But just then, as you're looking, a light flashes into a place where light is never seen, a light that allows you to see not just persons, but individuals. Adam is there, looking as old as the hills, and he looks up to no one in particular and cries out, I have been waiting all these eons for a healing from the tree of life. The prophet Isaiah is there, short and stocky with a full red beard, at least in my imagination, and with a kind of craziness in his eyes. He strides towards the light with his fist raised like a black panther on an Olympic award stand. Yes, I told you this would happen. The people who walked in a land of darkness have seen a great light. John the Baptist is there, talking that way of one who has lived far too long in the wilderness, you know, kind of mumbling to himself. But yet when you draw close to him, you can make out the words he can'ts. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And then the camera zooms in on Satan. Satan is gloating about his layup's triumph, a Jew named Jesus. Satan struts around hell, smooth, sleek, sure of himself, telling about how this Jesus was a real pain when he was on earth, healing people, restoring their faith in God, casting out some of Satan's best demons. But in the end, he was like all the rest, alone and afraid to face suffering and death. But suffer he did, and die he did, and now he's all mine. Death, played by Dom DeLuise, is not so sure. Like a nervous suburbanite who thinks that the, the property values in hell are going to go down with this new occupant moving in, he tries to explain his apprehension to Satan, explaining that he did not have a good feeling about all this. As a matter of fact, he has not had a good feeling since he swallowed that fellow Lazarus. For no sooner had death swallowed Lazarus whole than someone up above called him back and death has had a terrible sense of indigestion ever since. Well, Satan is right in the midst of trying to reassure his hand-wringing companion by telling him that everything's under control when suddenly their conversation is interrupted by a voice so loud you have to put your hands over your ears. Lift up your gate! Lift, be lifted up, O ancient doors. Now you've gone and done it, whines death to Satan. Now you've done it, I ain't trying to tell you, but no. Death scurries in that Dom DeLuise kind of half run. His panic cried to his minions, cracking his voice, making you want to laugh if it wasn't so intense. Make fast the doors, make fast the doors, make fast the great doors of hell. These doors are enormous. They're made of brass. They're reinforced with bars of iron, the strongest, most durable metals imaginable when the story was told. The great doors of hell grind shut. Great bars drop down, redoubling their security. And death heaves a great sigh of relief. The gates of hell are firmly and impenetrably closed. Hell is now safe and secure. Then that earthquake of voice thunders again. Lift up your gates that the king of glory may come in. Terrid, terrified and confused, death turns towards us, the audience, and asks, Who is the king of glory? And all the voices of heaven answer in a perfect 16-note chord. The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, strong in battle. And with that, the great doors of hell begin to groan and bend. There comes a shriek of metal being inexorably torn. And the great brass doors of hell are wrenched from their hinges. Jesus kicks in the doors of hell. Those mighty gates are nothing compared to the fury of his determination. He strides in like someone who owns the place. Satan and death fall back before him. He stretches out his hand to old Adam and lifts him up and stands him on shaky legs. He looks over that vast, endless crowd assembled over so many eons. And then, and then he blesses them all. 
He blesses the patriarchs and the prophets. He blesses the wise and the foolish. He, presses, he blesses the priests and the great thinkers, the lowly and forgotten. He blesses the saints and the sinners. He blesses them all. And then just as quickly as he stormed in, he spins and turns to go out the way he came. But he pauses, he half turns back and he waves his pierced hand. He signals for all of them to follow him. And as they follow him through those great doors that had held them in, they become a glorious staircase to paradise. They follow the king of glory who is Jesus our Lord, at whose name every knee on earth and on heaven and under the earth shall bow and every voice can proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Over his version of hell, Dante placed a sign which read, Abandon hope all ye who enter here. No more. No more. That Easter, Jesus fulfilled the promise he made to a fisherman named Peter when he said of that man's faith, Upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Let us stand and sing our response in song, Christ Arose. At the very end of our Good Friday service, the last thing that we said was the prayer, Jesus, remember me. We come on Easter to a table saying, remember me. And we come saying, Jesus, we remember you. And we come to celebrate that what Jesus did for us is for us. And we renew that commitment to him and to one another as we gather at this table. Will you join me now in the words of institution? For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Okay. 
serve. prayer for the bread. Lord, as we gather around this table on this Resurrection Sunday morning to take the bread representing your life that was broken for us, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to us and to all who have received you. We can't begin to imagine the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion, yet you took the pain for us. You died for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your death that gave us life, abundant life now and eternal life forever. As you instructed your disciples, we too receive the bread in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us take the bread together.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for making this no ordinary meal. We have been fed and nourished with your life as we have gathered around this table. Bless this cup and the ones that, are, that receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us give thanks to God. Gracious God, our being here is our prayer. It is a statement of our faith, of our commitment, of our hope, and of our life. This meal is so simple, but your gift is so great. May each time we gather at this table, may we be reminded of your love for us, of your grace upon us, and of our call to serve you in this world. For in Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. And now as a final thought to the service, uh, Andy Plemons is going to share with us the Holy City. Last night I lay a-sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, Methought the voice of angels from heaven in answering. Methought the voice of angels from heaven in answering. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to your And then methought me dream was changed, the streets no longer rang. Hushed were the glad hosannas the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery, the morn was cold and chill. As the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill, as the shadow of cross arose upon a lonely hill. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, hark how the angels sing. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to your King. And once again the scene was changed, new earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the tideless sea. The light of God was on its streets, the gates were open wide, and all who would might enter. And no one was denied. No need of moon or stars by night, no sun to shine by day. It was a new Jerusalem that would not pass away. It was a new Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem that would not pass away. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for the night is o'er. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna forevermore. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna forevermore. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Then go and serve. Amen.